<laughs> Good morning. And um, I'm going to be honest, we've had a little bit of a family head cold going through the family, and um, it's nothing that you need to be concerned about, trust me, else I wouldn't be standing here at the moment. Um, but my voice is a lot lower, and I guarantee that I will be sliding in a throat lozenge sometime uh, through this morning. So, and um, also you can pray because uh, we get to do this again this evening. <laughs> I hope I still have voice left this evening. Um, we find ourselves. It's hard to believe that we are at the end of the uh, First Peter. So we're in First Peter five uh, today. And before you open up your Bibles, I'm going to actually ask you not to do that yet because I'm going to read it to you. But I want you just to hear it today, as opposed to trying to follow along with me because it is. I'm using a different translation. It's really short. There's only 14 verses, and um, I just want you to hear it and uh, kind of take it in. Um, we are going to go through some of these verses. Remember, we're ahead of the homework and just giving you stuff that gives you some context, um, again, as you go into your homework. Um, but also, we're going to do a lot of application today because we're at the end of the letter. And um, I think it's time that we stop and think about some things that we've talked about at the beginning, um, ask some questions at the beginning, and, and just make sure we're thinking about that as we head into it. So um, just a reminder that this is a letter. Remember, we talked about this over and over again. This is a letter, and now we're coming to the very end of a letter, and Peter does very much what all of us would do. We might recap a couple of things. He does that, and then he ends with this beautiful benediction to us. Um, and so it's just a really wonderful portion of scripture, uh, but also want to remind you that um, there's a pretty big uh, focus on shepherding, and I'm going to stop and talk about that a little bit here, and you'll understand why uh, when, when we read through that. Um, so sit back and listen for a second to 1 Peter 5. Therefore, I strongly urge the elders among you, pastors, spiritual leaders of the church, as a fellow elder, as an eyewitness called to testify of the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd and guide and protect the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, and not motivated for shameful gain, but with wholehearted enthusiasm, not lording it over those, who, those assigned to your care. Do not be arrogant or overbearing, but be examples of Christian living to the flock. Set a pattern of integrity for your congregation, and when the chief shepherd, Christ, appears, you will receive the conqueror, conqueror's unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you younger men of lesser rank and experience, be subject to your elders. Seek their counsel, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Tie on the servant's apron, for God is opposed to the proud, the disdainful, the presumptuous, and he defeats them, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Set aside self-righteous pride so that he may exalt you to a place of honor in his service at the appropriate time, casting all of your cares, all your anxiety, all your worries, all your concerns once and for all on him. For he cares about you with deepest affection and watches over you very carefully. Be sober, well-balanced, and self-disciplined. Be alert and cautious at all times. The enemy of yours, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, fiercely hungry, seeking someone to devour. But resist him. Be firm in your faith against his attack, rooted, established, immovable, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being experienced by your brothers and sisters throughout the world. You do not suffer alone. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who imparts his blessing and favor, who called you to his own eternal glory in Christ, will himself complete, confirm, strengthen, and establish you, making you what you ought to be. To him be the dominion, power, and authority forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written you to you briefly to counsel and testify that this is the true grace, the undeserved favor of God. Stand firm in it. She, the church, who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends your greetings, and so does my son in the faith, Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. To all of you who are in Christ, may there be peace. Isn't that a great letter? Isn't that a great way to end this letter that you've been spending all this time in? Um, so a couple of the reminders that we were speaking of. Um, do you remember when I, I spoke earlier and we were talking about what is God preparing you for? Are you still thinking about that a little bit? Or have there been any reminders along the way that God is preparing you for something or you're in the middle of something and he's using 
uh, First Peter to, to speak to you. Keep thinking on that. That's very much um, a part of this. And this whole ending to this letter, remember we uh, spoke about how Megan and I were kind of the setup and then there was this explanation uh, that Cindy did of these different relationships you might find yourself in. And we told you there's five of those relationships, but there's only four so far that we've gone over. Well, there's one more today, right? And who is that too? The elders, right? He talks about all these other people groups, but he didn't speak to the elders. And now here at the end, he speaks to the elders. Have you ever given thought as to why that might be the case, why he waited? on that. Think about that as you do your homework. Um, some hints to that, I think uh, we don't necessarily know the answer, but I think part of it is uh, we remember uh, what we heard last first, and what's happening in Second Peter, and what's going to happen in Jude is this whole explanation that's going to come to you about false teachers and false shepherds. So while in other portions of scripture, I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, um, it talks about qualifications for elders. This is actually how elders are supposed to act, okay? And then how we're supposed to respond to that. So we're gonna spend some time on that, but we're gonna jump right back in though to, uh, if you wanna go ahead and open your Bibles, if you haven't done that yet, to 1 Peter 5, 1. I just wanna remind you of a couple of things. Therefore, there's that connector word, right? He uses it again, right at the beginning of 5, 1. Therefore, um, so who is he giving instructions to in this very first part? He's giving instructions to the elders. He's given them all to us, but now it comes to the elders. And he, Peter does a really interesting thing in that first verse in that he refers to himself as an elder, not an apostle. That's really important to remember. Think of that when you go through your homework. Um, he talks about being an eyewitness witness of the sufferings of Christ and a fellow heir to the glory to be revealed. Jen Wilkin, when she teaches this, talks about it being past, present, and future, right? So that his present standing when he wrote this is that he was an elder at that point in time. Yes, he was an apostle, but he was serving at that point as an elder, all right? And then the eyewitness of the sufferings of Christ would have been his past, and then the fellow heir of the glory to be revealed is his future. It's a really interesting word choice right there. So in verse two, he talks about um, uh, this call of elders to be shepherd, to be shepherds. I want to reflect back on some things that Megan told you on the very first day of Bible study when she gave a little background about Peter. And she talked about that recommissioning that took place um, after his denials and everything was falling apart in Peter's world, right? He had left everything. He had been with Jesus, his best friend. He has, he's killed. Things aren't rolling out the way he likes it He or was hoping to. He uh, denies Christ, and he goes back to the very thing that he knew, which was fish, fishing, right? And what happens? Jesus meets him at that point, right? Because that's what Jesus does. He meets us usually at that lowest point. He's been there all along. He calls him back in, and he recommissions him. Something that's really important to note in that recommissioning, in that portion of scripture in John, is when he was called to Jesus, how did Jesus call him? He said, come be fisher of men. That's right. Now what, he, what did he do in John? He asked him to shepherd. He's taken him out of fishing and putting him in a shepherd role. That is what he speaks to in John, and now that's what Peter is doing to the elders of his church, he's reminding them that they need to be shepherds and what that is to actually look like, all right? That's a really important piece right here. Um, some things to think about at shepherds, particularly at that point in time, uh, mom to mom gals, we talked about this, that shepherds use a rod and a staff. This is how we teach it. A rod protects, a staff corrects, okay? The rod protects, the staff corrects. That's how shepherds used the equipment that they had. This was defensive, and the staff always had a little hook. The way they corrected is they would grab an animal, and they were able to pull it back to safety. All right? So that's how to think of that, and that's exactly what he's saying here um, to his fellow elders in these churches that are going to uh, be hearing that. So it talks about, let me get to the right spot here. Um, Exercising oversight, not under compulsion, 
but voluntarily according to the will of God. I want to tell you, uh, just when if you've been at church a few weeks ago, right, you would have heard Gerald speak on the qualifications of elders, all right? Just, can I just say something really important about that? Those qualifications are, are very specific, but the reality is bunches of men at our churches, in our church, meet those qualifications. It's just that God, God's not going to use all of them necessarily to be elders, but those qualifications are still there among our men. We should rejoice about that. And they should still be speaking into the elders. We should be speaking into the elders. The elders are speaking into our lives. That's just how it works. It's really, really a great thing. But right here, he's giving really specific um, text to what their heart condition should be like. So I had a conversation one time uh, with some elders, not of this church, and we were talking about some other issues. But um, one of the elders, somebody I knew really well, said, you know, Missy, um, but he was talking about his call to be an elder. And he said, I bring, I bring a lot to the table. You know, because they are, they're gifted, they have talents, they bring, and he said, I bring a lot to the table. And I looked at him and I said, and the other elders, and I said, and there lies the problem. Because it's not about what we bring to the table, it's how we bring others to the table. And that's exactly what Peter is saying here. It's about the heart. Don't do it under compulsion because you feel like you have to. Don't do it to, for ill gain. He's reminding them about having a shepherd's heart, how we protect and how we correct. It's a wonderful portion of scripture. Um, and let's skip to verse 4, and he just talks about uh, when uh, the chief shepherd Christ appears to you, you will receive the conqueror's unfading crown of glory. What I just want to remind you, that is a reference back to 1-7 and 124 about fading gla uh, grass and um, perishable and imperishable. So you'll note that when you go through your homework. And in verse 5, this always seems a little confusing to some people. It says, likewise, you younger men of lesser rank and experience, be subject to your elders. Seek their counsel. And then we're going to stop right there before we talk all of this. So the question is, why is he talking to these young men? Well, one, a lot of them are new in the faith. Um, that's, that's part of it. But part of it is what was going on in Roman culture. I know in our small group, we talked about something. It's called Potter familia. Are you, uh, you, some of you may know what that is about Roman culture, but what was happening at the time in Roman culture is that whoever was the oldest male in the household had complete control over the entire household. All right, this is actually where the Godfather comes from, that it's that thing. They could, they had control of the finances, they had control over who married who, they, um, could uh, put somebody to death. The Roman culture actually, um, government really relied on them to oversee that within their family. So now you have these young men who are now believers, who have been raised in something that now looks very different than this new family they find themselves in Christ, right? And they're trying to figure out how they're supposed to respond to these elder men who are leading the church. So he gives them, and Peter knows that. He knows how hard this is to step out of culture and to step into this new family and do that. So that's what he's speaking to here. That's why he sing, singles them out, to remind them, hey, you have a new place. Let's remember your place and, and, and figure out this new way and how to respond uh, to your elders. Um, and uh, if you remember, um, I was talking before about um, how Peter was speaking to the entire room, right? To the Jewish believers and the Gentile believers. This is another way that Peter is speaking to the entire room because the second half of this sentence talks to us. It talks to us how we are supposed to respond to these elders, right? It's right there. It says that all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Tie on the servant's apron for God is opposed to the proud the disdainful, the presumptuous, and he defeats them, but he gives grace to the humble. That's from Proverbs 3.34. I think many of you know that. Um, 
So it's a reminder to everybody in the room, we all fall under this leadership structure that the Lord has put together within our churches, okay? So it's a warning to elders. It's encouragement to young men who are trying to find their way and the rest of us on how to live within that, all right? There's the application for you right there. Okay, uh, verse 6, I just want you to know, it says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. That therefore is the last therefore, right, in, in this portion of the letter. And that therefore, again, is reminding you, now that we've said all this, now that we've shown you all this, and then it goes on and gives uh, some more correction. Um, And verse 7 is just a continuation of what is already there. Uh, Again, it's taking, um, Peter is uh, quoting directly um, from uh, Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount that is taken from the Old Testament when it says, cast all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns once and for all, right? It is reminding people of where to cast our anxieties and our concerns. And where do those go? They go to the Lord right? When we cast them other places, we will never have it fulfilled and healed and move the way it does to the one person who knows the entire story. So it's just a reminder, hey, I know you have struggles. I know you have anxiety. I know all this is happening. Let me remind you of what the Old Testament said that Jesus spoke to where you should cast that, all right? It's a great pullback um, in remembrance there. Oh, verse 8, be sober, well-balanced, self-disciplined. Be alert and cautious at all times. That enemy of yours, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, fiercely hungry, seeking someone to devour. But resist him. Be firm in your faith against his attack, rooted, established, immovable, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being experienced by your brothers and sisters throughout the world. I was reminding my group, um, Megan, last fall, uh, did was it last fall or two years ago for mom to mom uh, did our opening in September did a really wonderful teacher teaching on being sober minded it was really really good I would recommend you going back and listening to that because it's on this portion of scripture and what that really means and how we go about uh, living a sober minded or self controlled life but that's that's what that's speaking to here but I want you to note in eight <laughs> the predatory nature of the language right? A lion prowling, roaring, devouring. And this is a warning against our sin. I think most of us, well, maybe just me, I am always, you know, right there on the line. <laughs> I'm, I'm a, a toe away from sinful behaviors most of the time. And it's just a reminder of how dangerous that is and where we need to find and seek shelter. And that Satan is waiting right outside the door. We told, again, our mom-to-mom ladies last week, we were reminding them that who's the loudest voice in their kids' ears? We asked them that question. Because if it's not theirs, I guarantee when they step outside that door, that culture is waiting and willing to fill those spaces, right? Well, it's the same with us, right? Are we filling it with God's word, word and his truth? and his correction, because this letter is a lot about correction to us, at least it has been to me, it's the same thought. We are right there on the line most of the time. The devil's prowling. He's waiting to to pounce on you, all right? It's a warning against that. That's what he's saying. And he tells you how to resist in verse 9. You know, be firm in your faith, be rooted, be established, and reminding you that you don't suffer alone. All right, you are not the only one suffering your situation. Um, that doesn't mean you don't, uh, that you just inwardly take that. It's just a reminder of hope that that's part of the Christian life, right? That was spoken to last week. It's going to be spoken to a lot in the next couple of weeks. Verse 10 is a really important one because what it says here, after you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who imparts his blessing and favor, who called you to his own eternal glory in Christ, will himself, himself, Complete, confirm, strengthen, and establish you, making you what you ought to be. You can just spend all day thinking about those four words, those promises right there. So in your homework, when you get to that pause, spend some time with that. Complete, confirm, strengthen, and establish. And then in 111, we have this beautiful benediction. 
To him be dominion, power, authority forever and ever. Amen. At the very end, he talks about peace. That's the same benediction he actually gives earlier in 112, where he talks about peace. That's really the end of his letter to all of us, but then he has this little tag on here, and that might be a little confusing to you on what he's doing and what he's speaking to. Um, it says, by Silvanus, our faithful brother, that's Silas, okay? Same person, but it's Silas. So we need to probably remember who Silas was, and he uh, partnered along uh, with Barnabas and Paul and did a lot of their excursions together, ended up in prison. He was considered a very, very uh, uh, faithful and, and encouraging brother. He was an example of really uh, working through hard ex circumstances. He wasn't uh, super verbal and out loud. You don't hear a lot about that. Um, but he seemed to have this inner ability to just trust every circumstance to the Lord. All right, and so uh, what happened here in this letter is that it was spoken by Peter, but it was written down by Silas. But this last little couple of sentences were, were actually written by Peter himself. So that's why it's saying there, hey, by Silvanus, our faithful brother, I have written to you briefly. So it's just a way of validating um, at a time in church history when who was speaking and who was writing was really in question. All right, so that's what's going on right there. Um, verse 13, uh, I just want to explain what it says there about Babylon. That might be a little question mark too, and there are different thoughts on this. It says, uh, so he's written to him, your true grace of God, stand firm in it. She, now in my Bible, it says the church who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, send your greetings, and so does my son. That she um, and Babylon... There are different beliefs. Some people believe that he, Peter, may have been speaking about his wife at that point in time and was back supporting them. Some people believe that he may have actually been in Babylon. Um, but the primary belief and the one that I go with is that he is using Babylon as a way to describe how bad Rome was. But Rome, Roman Christians were being persecuted right now uh, under Nero and were just being slaughtered right and left. So him writing this, he is believed to be in Rome, and uh, it was a way to protect the church, to protect where that letter was coming from as it was being moved about. All right, so that's, you'll, you'll do some research on that during your homework, and you can take a look and see what you find to believe, but I think that actually is the belief um, right there. And then it says, um, Greet one another with a kiss of love. You actually see that, that expression a few different times in scripture. Um, it is really meant to be a cultural thing, that people would kiss somebody on the cheek, right? You see that over in Europe all the time. That's really what it's, it's speaking to. It's a greeting, and it's also a goodbye to kiss somebody on the cheek that way. And, to, and it ends with, to all of you who are in Christ, may there be peace. Isn't it interesting that that's how he ends the letter? To all of you who are in Christ, May there be peace. After talking about all the suffering and all the challenges and how to live in this new family, he's offering peace. Who else did that? Jesus, right? I leave you, right, I leave you the peace. Peter um, reflects back on Jesus a lot in his writing. All right, so that is the end of this letter. We've gone through it in detail. We've sifted everything out. I was wondering um, how your small groups are doing in our small group today. Um, did anybody get to day six in their discussions today talking about where the judgment of Christ will start, whether it will be uh, with the believers or not? Did anyone get to that question? It was a challenging one in ours. We're actually going to talk about it next week because <laughs> there are different thoughts on that. Um, so there's been a lot to take in. So can I make a recommendation for you? When you finish your homework this week, it's not too much. Um, so when you finish your homework, take some time just to sit and be still and read through this letter from beginning to end without stopping. It'll only take you 10 minutes, all right? Um, it's something Megan had the teachers do before we started everything. And just read the letter as a letter, remember? As I'm writing to one of my children or you're writing a letter to me, just take it in that way. 
And then a little preview, we jump right in to uh, the second Peter uh, letter, and uh, Carrie Squires is going to be, Lord willing, is going to be teaching on that and have some really great things and, and prefacing that letter for you next week. So that's where we are, and that's where we're going. So let me pray, and uh, you can head your way out of here today. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for um, your word. And as Megan said earlier, we do not discount the fact that we get to freely stand and speak it and hear it and be corrected by it and to be encouraged and it gives us hope. And that's what this letter from Peter has been all about. You know, he, he says it at the very end, the reason why he gives the letter to us. And um, may we just be encouraged by that today, Lord. As we go from here, and uh, we remember your words and we remember phrases. Um, may we also acknowledge with thankfulness that that came from you and the sacrifice that your son made on our behalf, Lord. May uh, the difference that your son's death made and his resurrection um, in our life will be seen and noted with those we interact with. May that light shine so brightly in us that others will be interested and they will ask, so why are you different? Why do you respond the way you do? And may your love and your mercy uh, flow through the words and in our interactions. We love you, Lord. Be with us as we go from today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>